Good morning. Happy Friday. Hello. Welcome, welcome. We're so glad that you're here um, to share in learning and thinking about guided pathways with us in this 3CSN um, Cerritos guided pathways spotlight session. We were just having this fantastic conversation about birds chirping. I'm hoping there's lots of birds chirping in your background wherever you are in the state right now. You might not even be in the state. You might be choosing to think about guided pathways while you're in a lawn chair in Hawaii. If that's the case, cheers for you being here with us wherever you might be. We're going to give folks just another minute to come on in the door and get adjusted and comfy, get your tea or your coffee. Hi, good morning to all. I am uh, Sung Lu and I'm from Mission College. Like you guys can see the side behind me. <laughs> Very nice. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. And you're in our second one. You came and joined us for Shasta too. It's so great to see yes. you. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, we are uh, mission now. We talk a lot about the guided pathway and actually we still don't have the clear cut plan. It's still on the talk somehow, but I love to learn how the other school uh, completed. Uh, at least you guys can give us some idea to process. <laughs> right. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kirsten Elliott um, from Santa Monica College. Sorry, I'm going to be popping in and out. I'll definitely be listening. <laughs> I promise. I just I was going to multitask for a minute. Sorry. We understand. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. Well, come on, people. Don't be shy. Say hello. We want to meet you. <laughs> I think we want to hear what's happening in, I'm assuming, Pennsylvania. <laughs> Ah, HACC Central PA Community College. Hmm. Oh, wow, a heat, a heat wave tomorrow. So, hmm. my video doesn't seem to be working, but I'm Jen, I'm in PA, and I'm actually the assessment coordinator and an associate professor of biology but I'm here in that assessment coordinator role because I am on a guided pathways subcommittee and we're in the process of implementing guided pathways and I'm supporting the development of an assessment plan for that, for guided pathways. So I just, I saw this pop up in, in the listserv and just had to join to try to hear from everybody else what best practices you've established for assessment of guided pathways. Great. Hello. Oh, wow. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jacqueline Rogers, and I currently work at North Central University. Um, however, before my retirement from full time work, I um, worked at Palm Beach State Community College, and uh, the Guided Pathway Project was getting underway as I was uh, leaving. However, I am mentoring a doctoral student from North Central who is using the guided pathway in her research project. So there's a lot of, I'm sure, good information that I'll be able to provide her with today. She couldn't be with us. Fantastic. Jacqueline, I was admiring your the drawing um, that you have as your image. Um, is that, did you do that yourself or is that, I, I did it myself. I used uh, one of our approved backgrounds at the university and then did a clip art search for the caduceus and put it in there and uh, on a PowerPoint slide and then saved the slide as a picture and then you uploaded it to Zoom for my background. But didn't you have a, when you logged in or maybe, was that somebody else? Oh, what? that was my, you're talking about this. Yeah, it's beautiful. Oh, thank you. This is a sketch that was created for me when I was at a conference in um, New Orleans. And one of the artists, I was going around Jackson Square. If you've ever been there, it's near the Cafe Dumont. 
and you can go shake off the powdered sugar. <laughs> and, uh, so the artist asked if she could uh, do my portrait and I agreed. And this is actually a photograph, a, a highlighted photograph of the portrait that's hanging in my bedroom. Probably way more than you wanted to know, but it's, um, I added a little color contrast to it. So, but thank you. Very nice. That's very nice. Thanks. I'll leave it up for you. <laughs> we'll do a couple introductions here. And if that moves you to want to share um, a little more about who you are and, and where you're from, what your connections to guided pathways are, um, what sparks you to come today. Um, it'd be so great to, to hear that. We, we all learn from each other, right? This, this kind of work is so integrated that um, those connections and partnerships, especially those thought partnerships, um, are so valuable. Um, so uh, we at 3CSN here today, there are two of us. Um, I'm Nicole Bryant Lesher. I'm English faculty and a coordinator with 3CSN. Um, I work way up here in the trees in the far north at College of the Redwoods. Um, home of uh, mushrooms, banana slugs, all things uh, that like uh, like the fog, and also um, kind of grow in a fractal sort of integrated sort of way. So guided pathways makes a lot of sense with uh, with what we see in and around us in the natural world up here. Um, I will be your um, you know, your boat rower, your ship captain, your little MC to keep things rolling as we go today. Um, and I am joined by um, my amazing colleague who makes all things work in all spaces, and that is Rebecca Moonstone. Rebecca, do you want to introduce yourself? Well, certainly. My name is Rebecca Moonstone. I am retired from Riverside City College. Woohoo! And I uh, work currently with 3CSN. Uh, I'm here to help you in whatever way I can uh, in the chat. Please post your questions in the chat and I will help you if you have any questions or concerns, anything that, you know, is relevant to what we're doing. And I will make sure I be to the best of my ability. Thanks, Rebecca. And with that, um, how about we learn a little bit more about our um, colleagues at Cerritos today that will be sharing on their Guided Pathways work. Um, Angela or Tracy, whoever wants to, to share first, we would, we would love to know more about you. Sure. I'll go, I'll go ahead. Uh, my name is Angela Hoppy Nagao, and I'm full-time faculty at Cerritos College. In addition to working with Guided Pathways, I'm the chair of the Communication Studies Department. And I have been working with Guided Pathways as one of the faculty coordinators since about the time the pandemic hit. <laughs> I think I was in my role, and, a, and about a month later, we went into lockdown. So. Um, I was uh, serving kind of in peripheral roles just as, you know, faculty sitting on the like task force involving it prior to that, but it's been a really, really positive, positive experience and I love working with my co-coordinator Tracy Ukita. Tracy? Thank you, Angela. Tracy Ukita. I'm also a full-time faculty member at Cerritos College. Specifically, I work in the Career Services Department as a counselor. Um, and I'm wrapping up a stint, about a nine year stint, I think it is, as the instructional chair for our counseling division. Um, but I've been a guided pathways faculty coordinator since basically year two, um, but was heavily involved in the first year. But we'll, and we'll tell you a little bit about how all this stuff evolved. But, um, but that was, at the first year was really under the leadership of somebody else at that time. So. But uh, nice to have you here today. Thank you so much for joining us. I think see that Natalie Nectal just logged on too. So welcome, Natalie. It's good to see you. Natalie has really been very helpful for our team as an excellent resource um, and has joined us too with some of our meetings um, over the past couple of years. Welcome, Natalie. All right. Um, Natalie, did you want to, you just arrived, but we did do some introductions. Did you want to say hello or say a little bit more about your um, connection to Guided Pathways with Cerritos? Yeah, um, sure, I can. It's just that I'm, um, 
I'm not feeling that well because I'm, I'm having some asthma issues. Oh. And so I just wanted to, to be here to support. But um, so I really won't be talking that much, but I just wanted to say hello to everybody. Um, I'm the Guided Pathways Regional Coordinator for Los Angeles, Orange County region. And Cerritos College is one of my colleges that I support. <coughs> Excuse me. And so anyway, so anyway, I'm so happy to be here today and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to the, to the presentation. Thank you all. Thanks, Natalie. Yeah, and hope you feel better soon. It's good to see you though. Well, and shall we? To go ahead and- Yeah, we are ready for you. We are ready for okay. you. Well, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So we do have a PowerPoint for you, um, of course. So let me go ahead and get that queued up here. And then I think we'll just jump on in. As, we're, as Tracy's getting that all queued up, um, we encourage you, if you have any questions along the way, please don't hesitate to put your questions in the chat room and ask. Um, we really do value a conversational approach, but we'll also try to leave time at the end for questions and answers. So I'm hoping this is okay. You're able to see it. All right, great. I see the double thumbs up from Angela there. So, okay. So I think we'll go ahead and get started. So again, welcome. It's so great to have you all here today. Uh, we already introduced ourselves, uh, but again, Tracy Ukita, Angela Hopping the Gal from Cerritos College. And we thought we would share with you kind of just how this has all rolled out for us over the past, I guess now four years, which seems kind of crazy. Um, and it goes by quickly, right, Angela? It's cool. Yes, it really does. Yeah, and so we, and we thought we would hit some of the points that um, I think the three CSN folks have um, uh, or will be sharing in the chat in a moment with some guiding questions. Um, anything you want to add before I move on, Angela? I just say we're going to organize our presentation around the different years and how we've approached guided pathways and what we're focusing on in each year. And we'll talk a little bit about what we're going to do looking forward also. All right. So fall 2017. So like most of the California community colleges, we really didn't get started until the 2017-2018 academic year. Um, so we got started under the leadership of, at that time, the Dean of Liberal Arts, um, Mr. David Favish, and he provided excellent leadership and gathered a group of folks together as part of what he was calling an exploratory committee um, so that we can, you know, get a better sense of the Guided Pathways framework and just nationwide efforts and different resources out there. And also, of course, to complete that original self-assessment report uh, that was a required first step in the pursuit of the Guided Pathways Award money through our chancellor's office. Um, that was a big effort in that fall 2017 term. And while completing that assessment, it became really clear that there, oops, sorry, that there is a need for task forces or teams. There we go. Um, or teams that could focus on various aspects of guided pathways. So these were their original teams. I don't know, Angela, if you wanted to say anything about some of these, because I know you were involved in a couple. I was involved in a couple. Yeah, one of the things that I really appreciated that Dean David Fabish did, who's now since retired, is that he invited the entire campus to join one of these kind of task force teams. They were including areas of interest, on-ramping students, communication, tracking, IT and um, IERP support, student guidance, and then what model, we, what guided pathways model we were going to follow. And I'll be honest, you know, first year of anything, it was a little bit bumpy and we were trying to figure out what um, all these different groups were doing and there was some natural overlap. But the really great thing is it started the conversation and we brought together a wide cross section of people from across campus to begin working on these projects. And it was a very interesting year. It's so funny. I don't know if I shared this with you before, Angela, but looking back, I realized David really knew like he knew what to do. He was very 
um, uh, knowledgeable about these efforts. He'd spend a lot of time, I think, uh, just researching things. And the rest of us were really just trying to gain our bearings. And it wasn't for me until a good year or so in looking back that I realized, wow, there was so much to learn and he knew and he could see uh, further ahead. Um, but uh, for the rest of us, <laughs> uh, it took a little bit of time, and as Angela mentioned, uh, Mr. Davis did retire actually at the end of that academic year. Um, that put us in flux a little bit. So as we moved into year two, um, there was just myself. Um, actually, it was me and at the time an English professor, Dr. Frank Nixon, we were tapped to be faculty coordinators, but because David Fabish retired, um, Dr. Nixon was asked to step in as the acting dean of liberal arts. Um, so there was a period of time where um, there were just a few of us kind of uh, looking at these efforts and trying to pull uh, different folks together. We did have our vice president of academic affairs kind of overseeing the whole thing. But as you know, vice president of academic affairs has so much going on. Um, so it was kind of me and Dr. Mixon. We had a, um, another English faculty member for a short period of time, a few months, who also was able to provide a little bit of support there. So we had to kind of really be thoughtful about how we're prioritizing our efforts with a very limited number of resources, especially in terms of folks who could really uh, coordinate a lot of these efforts. So uh, Dr. Mixon and I had been already um, coordinating a program called the PACT program or the Program for Accelerated Completion and Transfer, which was kind of a mini guided pathways effort before we really had guided pathways coming in on our campus. Uh, so we spent a lot of time with that. We spent a lot of time gearing up for AB 705. For those of you who are not uh, in California, it's really our um, effort statewide uh, to ensure that students have access right off the bat to transferable English and math and to really get them through those transferable English and math courses within the first year and basically doing away with our placement tests that we had for years and years and years. And so we spent a lot of time looking at that. Frank and I really uh, supported that effort particularly in the development of a tool that we use for placement that we call the self-report tool. Um, there's also a guided placement tool that uh, was developed as well. So much time looking at AB 705 and gearing up for that implementation. And then of course, you know, uh, guided pathways, um, there's a lot that we need to rely on technology for. So these technology enabled interventions are really critical to the work of guided pathways. And, and our campus has always kind of struggled, I would say, with some of those sorts of resources and implementing them uh, seamlessly. And we did spend much time during, I guess, technically year two, which felt like us, like it was year one, um, but spent a lot of time during that year to vet a number of technological tools. And we'll share a little bit more about that in a moment. And of course, looking at our meta majors. So, David Fabish, as I mentioned, for the first year, pulled a bunch of folks together as part of an exploratory committee. In the second year, we turned that into what we call the GPAC, the Guided Pathways Advisory Committee. Mm -hmm. It's not a formal shared governance committee. Uh, we are just now looking at ways to kind of pull in guided pathways, but also integrate it with our C program efforts. Um, so equity and um, also um, success, student success achievement. Um, so we don't have a formal structure just yet, but we're heading in that direction. So we've been um, convening this Guided Pathways Advisory Committee along the way. And these are some of the folks who are initially involved, including Angela. Angela, did you want to say something about this too? Yeah, I was going to say one of the things you can think about, although the GPAC, which Tracy's always great at coming up with these acronyms, the GPAC, um, they did, it did two, had really two broad simultaneous functions. One is that it provided some structure going forward. We got key players in the room who were all in the room together who could discuss issues. But this group also served as a bit of a think tank mm -hmm. to share ideas, to brainstorm. Um, we had a lot of people, <coughs> excuse me, as you know, from our campus, as we have those people come to your campus from other campuses. And so we were able to share a lot of experiences that were going on elsewhere. And this began to slowly evolve as a group that really was able to provide direction moving 
forward. And through this came so many of our initiatives, such as what technology are we going to adapt? Um, what type of faculty roles are we going to have? And so forth. So a broad range of people, we, we met once a month. Tracy always brought the best dessert, so people were sure to show up, which was great. And, um, and this really began to get things going. But we also realized that within this group, people knew what guided pathways were, and we needed to find a way to get these messages out to the broader campus. So, Tracy? I do have to say, Angela, I know you attributed GPAC to me. It was actually our, at that time, I think she was the incoming faculty senate president, Dr. April Bracamontes, um, who said GPAC. <laughs> so oh, I'm like, yes, yes, we're using that. Um, and it has stuck. So yeah. thanks to April. So I mentioned a moment ago that um, the guided pathways to roll out a lot of these efforts really do depend a lot on having technology that could support the efforts in the first place. And so we did spend a lot of time in year two vetting different technological tools. Uh, I know it might be a little hard to see, but this is these are some of the resources that we took a look at and the different functionality that they could potentially provide. Now we are a PeopleSoft campus. Um, so the third one that you see here, High Point, um, is a company that works directly with supporting a lot of PeopleSoft uh, functionality. So we were really hoping to find, um, ideally, uh, one program, so the one program that can serve all these different purposes, but largely we're looking for things that could support the intake or onboarding process, potentially a little bit of career exploration, uh, major exploration decision making, tracking student progress. We did not have an early alert system in place. Um, so we were in, in dire need of something to uh, allow us to, to implement some sort of early alert measures and early alert um, functionality. Uh, we were also hoping that there's something that could help us with the program mapping piece and uh, maybe even some functionality that could support the counseling and advising piece. So we were looking for the one program to rule them all. And I feel like we were mildly successful in that there really isn't one, um, but we feel like we came pretty close. And, and some of you are probably familiar, of course, with Starfish as well as EAB, and those were kind of the two front runners, and they had a lot of the same kind of functionality. And we did end up with EAB and are in the process now of implementing Navigate on our campus. Um, one of the other large efforts from that second year had to do with our meta majors. Um, so the work on meta majors, it actually continued uh, um, just beyond that second year, but uh, in the spring of the second year, we, we did uh, spend a lot of time really looking at getting campus feedback um, on our meta majors efforts. And we, this is just an example of one of the events that we did in the spring of 2018. We actually put together an electronic major sort um, and we asked campus, the campus community, whether it be students, faculty, staff, managers, community members, to come on up and participate in that electronic major sort um, so that we can get some feedback about what made sense to folks in terms of certain programs and how they might relate to some potential meta majors, even to provide us with feedback on what we should call the meta majors. Uh, so we had them basically fill out a Google uh, form. And there's some information about what the effort was about. And here's an example of a piece of that Google form with the electronic major sort. So we had some proposed meta majors already. Um, and we want to get a sense of how clearly certain programs could be aligned with these different uh, meta majors. And then, of course, we did it, as I mentioned, wanted to ask them about what they thought would be uh, a good uh, title to for, refer to these meta majors. And we did end up landing on learning and career pathways, the one at the bottom there. One of the, there were a couple really nice things about this approach. I mean, it was a fun project, but we were able to get feedback from all campus constituents on what to call the learning and career pathways. Um, students got to give feedback on how they thought different majors fit within to the, the different paths. And all the while, while we're getting feedback, we're also promoting the program. And it's helping to increase awareness. And it was really nice because 
faculty, deans, everybody were able to weigh in on this and what it was going to look like, which I think is really key to get buy-in. And you want as many people as possible to be able to give that feedback. And so that was really well done. And go ahead. Sorry, Tracy, go ahead. <laughs> well, no, no, that's that. Thank you for sharing that, Angela. I think um, your point, especially about just, just kind of the exposure, uh, generating some conversation about guided pathways, no one uh, really having a good sense at that time of what it is. Um, so it was a really good opportunity just to kind of get people talking about it. Um, and so I really had a lot of fun actually doing those events. I went to, we, we did one for about a two, three hour period of time in the afternoon and one in the evening. Um, and just being able to talk to different students and particularly faculty members that came and participated. Um, so it was a really worthwhile event. We did supplement that with some surveys. Um, we surveyed uh, the students, about a thousand students or so ended up responding, provided information about not just the meta majors piece, but we also asked them a little bit too about what they may be struggling with, what other things might have been helpful to them, especially as they were first getting started. We also did some surveys with the classified staff and the faculty, um, and we did some presentations as well as to different groups, including the student group and faculty senate and so on. Okay, so heading into year three, um, really the work on meta majors continued, of course, throughout that year. Um, and we took some time over the summer to pull all that data that we had collected during the spring, uh, to, to pull all that data together and then ask the GPAC folks to look at it early in the fall semester. Um, that's really where we did make that decision to go with learning and career pathways. It was kind of interesting because there was, there, there was learning and career pathways and areas of interest they were neck and neck. And um, I remember having conversations about these, but LCPs or learning and career pathways just kind of edged out areas of interest. Um, it was really uh, fun to have some of those conversations. Um, I actually wanted areas of interest, um, but now I'm used to the LCP way of being. And I think it's been a really great experience overall, just again, having some of these conversations. We actually had started a little bit of program mapping yeah. at the end of year two, but really went more full force into this effort in year three. I feel yeah. like year three is a year where we really started to see a bit of the transformation from Guided Pathways. And honestly, partially because this is the year I came on, year three, second semester. But you had a lot of things. The college in showing its commitment to Guided Pathways really codified our faculty coordinator positions, created job descriptions and so forth, which also brought further attention to the program. And then as Tracy said, then we launched a Tracy really launched this um, mapping program, which I came on, I participated in the first half, first semester as a participant in doing the mapping, and then second semester helping to facilitate where we started doing this online through Zoom because of the pandemic. But this was also a very instrumental event in that we took program mapping to every division and every department and had them map out their programs. So again, increasing awareness, but also getting buy-in and commitment to the program because the faculty are now designing this. And we invited students in to um, participate and share with this as well. And Tracy, I may have jumped ahead. Do you want to go back to the previous slide just to share what we ended up with? Or I just realized that I had um, animation from that other slide. Just it was more a matter of how some of the uh, titles of the meta majors um, of our LCP kind of shifted a little bit over time when we find them, but um, that, that was it. Yeah, so we I see we have a question in the chat from Jennifer, if we could share more about the faculty coordinator positions. You know, one of the things, um, I recently was sitting in a session where they were talking about leading from the middle. And I really love that concept about leading from the middle. And there's many different ways we could look at this. But one of the things that we knew at Cerritos, if we were going to really get the faculty buy-in, we needed to have faculty coordinators. So at this time, our college has committed to two faculty coordinators. And um, each coordinator gets um, some release time. We get 60% release time 
to um, give to the Guided Pathways program. Um, I don't know about Tracy. I know like my contract is for two years and then I have the chance to re-up it if I want to. And there's a whole lot of duties involved with the Guided Pathways coordinator position and um, including some of the things that we're showing here today. So Jennifer, is there something, anything more we can tell you about the coordinator positions? Um, so I'm just wondering, would you be willing to share with me the duties of your faculty coordinators? We are not, I'm realizing we're moving toward implementation, but, I, and I'm not directly involved. Like I said, I was brought on to help develop an assessment plan, but I haven't been part. So I'm part of that subcommittee, but I'm concerned. And I was talking with the, the, Dean who's coordinating guiding guided pathways that our faculty are very disconnected from this process. So our entire week zero for professional development when, when we return to school in the fall is going to be focused on guided pathways. And I'm now thinking maybe that's a little bit too little too late, right? But um, I'm so I'm it, but we have at with other projects, we have had faculty coordinators, but for this one, we don't. And it seems to be critical to the success of implementation. So I would be curious to see if you have like a job description, if you would be willing to share that. And I also just, you know, you said 60% release time. I was just curious the size of Cerritos because we have about 19,000 students. Yeah, we have about 17, 16 to 17 FTS and about 22, uh, 23,000 headcount. So pretty comparable, it sounds like, in size to yours. So Maybe Jennifer, we yeah. can definitely get you that job description. I don't know. Um, we can even dig around, see if we can find it today before we're done. Otherwise, make sure that we get your email address and we can follow up and email it to you. Mm -hmm. And then actually, Jennifer, I, I think was it you that um, had a question about Eleusian uh, degree works. And uh, while we do not use that at uh, Cerritos, I also worked for many years at Pasadena City College, um, and they they use it there. Um, and it's a pretty um, so I think with all these programs, right? There's pros and cons, and some are a little bit more. Um, cumbersome than others. I think Elysian degree works. Uh, actually, I think it's it's for ed education planning purposes works quite well. Um, but I also know that for a lot of these sorts of things that there's so much that has to go into the back end and setting it up. And a lot of how well things work later has to do with what happens in the setup. And that would also be true with our own experience with PeopleSoft. I actually do like our PeopleSoft ed planning um, uh, I guess it's more of what they call a bolt on. It wasn't part of PeopleSoft delivered when we first got it, um, but I do, I do like it. But as I said, there's pros and cons, I think, to each of these kinds of um, enterprise, you know, types of programs. So, um, so can I just awesome. say, I found a draft of our coordinator position. It's from 2019, so it's a little old, but um, it'll give you a general idea. And I'll That's put that. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'll put it in the chat room. Give me just a second. And it is definitely a concern. I guess if uh, you know there's not a lot of faculty involvement. Um, I, I feel really fortunate that on our campus from the outset, uh, the VP of Academic Affairs, Rick Miranda, he he acknowledged and recognized how critical it is uh, to have faculty involved, particularly in the leadership of this effort. Um, by the way, I, you know, I should also mention we do have a vice president of student services, Dr. Dusty Perez. Um, when we first got started with this, so we were in transition, just kind of leadership overall at the college. Um, and so she wasn't in place at that time. Um, we had another vice president who was um, on his way toward retirement. And so he ended up wrapping things up, I think, at the same at the same time that David Babish did. Um, and then Dr. Perez came in. I might have been close to a year later. Several, several months at least later. Um, and Dr. Perez, of course, is also um, a big cheerleader when it comes to guided pathways. 
So, so the other technology um, piece sorry. that I wanted to share. Oh, go ahead. I, see, I was just going to say, Jennifer, I dropped the uh, rough draft of the job description in the chat room for you. Thank you so much. And then uh, Jennifer McKenzie, as far as classified. So um, because we didn't have a formal committee, uh, so the GPAC was just kind of informal. Everyone was invited to participate who wanted to. Uh, we had different folks kind of come in and out. We had a student, actually we've had two students at different times who participated as well. Uh, classified staff, uh, right now, we actually have our classified um, union uh, kind of who, who's identified a couple of classified uh, staff members to sit on the GPAC uh, committee. But before that, it was just as people were interested in, um, in participating. So, you know, here or there, folks would come by, but it wasn't consistent until this year. Um, so the other technology piece that we really paid a lot of attention to during uh, that, this particular year was the implementation of CCC MyPath. And um, for those of you not in California, uh, it's really a free web-based onboarding platform. It was developed by our Chancellor's Office Tech Center. Um, and it provides students with um, a customized kind of series of what they call advisor cards. So it's really like next steps upon submitting the application. So they submit the application and it prompts them to take on their next steps. So um, it's, it's just a way to make sure that students are going through the matriculation steps and getting connected to the resources they might need to get connected to. Um, so this was actually a big effort in the fall of 2018. And um, we do still have it in place now, but we will probably be uh, moving away from it once Navigate is fully implemented. Okay. Oh, and speaking of Navigate. Uh, speaking of Navigate. Navigate, oh my Lord. <laughs> EAB Navigate has been a big portion, and it's really interesting to me as a faculty coordinator um, that this is such a key part of Guided Pathways, right? Helping students get on the right path, helping them stay on the path, and using technology in a way that's innovative and smart to be effective. So Tracy highlighted for you all the different programs. We chose EAB, and we're in the process of implementing it. Um, we kind of serve in an advisory role over the implementation. We sit on, on meetings, we talk, we share feedback and so forth on a lot of these things, but it's a big, big effort getting this implemented. And this is where some of our Guided Pathways money is going towards this program. Right. And it's, it is going to be a long process, as Angela mentioned. We really got started in uh, the 2018-2019 academic year in terms of vetting these tools. We did go through with um, uh, identifying Navigate as the tool that we'd pursue at the end of the 2019 academic year. Um, but we didn't really start working on sec securing it until year three, um, which we're going to get to next. But here's, I think, maybe one other slide that had some images from um, navigate, but it sounded, was it Jennifer Billman that you all are using navigate now? I think I saw in the chat. Someone moved from starfish to navigate. Although of course the irony is now, right? EAB acquired starfish, Hobson's by starfish. So we're all under the same company now. Yeah. But again, so this is just, we kind of got started looking at these tools, but the heavy lifting, particularly when it comes to navigate, um, is really going on basically now, <laughs> so, mm -hmm. yeah. So into this academic year, yes, go for it, Angela. Yeah, that brings us to year four and our continued quest to get faculty involved, students involved and refine some of the models we're using. And we started with some professional development. I think we can go next slide, Tracy. And one of the things that we did to really try to continue to promote guided pathways, but to also bring about some of the cultural change that is necessary to really implement guided pathways, we launched Guided Pathways Presents. And throughout the whole last year, Tracy and I offered approximately 10 different professional development workshops through our Center for Teaching Excellence. And um, the really neat thing was we, we were going to do this anyway, and then, you know, 
COVID hit and everything. And so we just did all of these through Zoom and it was a really successful event. Um, so our first session was simply everything you ever wanted to know about Guided Pathways, where we really just covered the four pillars of Guided Pathways and some of the changes that are implementing. Then um, the second workshop, we brought in a guest speaker, um, Dr. Kimberly Duff, a psychology professor, to talk about rethinking the science behind learning and using psychology to enhance the classroom experience. Because that fourth pillar of Guided Pathways really asks us to focus on how we are teaching and our students are learning and she was able to share some really innovative practices. We had a guest team from the ASCCC including um, Janet Fultz, Ginny May, Jeff Hernandez who did a great workshop for us on using the GP framework to mitigate challenges and we were put into groups. Each group had different tasks. They all ran into problems with simple things like trying to declare a major and really this is one of the things that we know that Guided Pathways is reminding us let's remove some of the unintended barriers and so it was a really fantastic um, exercise for us. We looked at instructional strategies to promote student equity and engagement, guided pathways, and we had our student learning outcome coordinator come talk because there's a lot that we need to do there. We um, had a great workshop from our counselors, Tracy and Brittany Lundeen on transfer one-on-one, -on -one, 101 for faculty, what faculty needed to know to help students with that process. Connecting coursework to our students' lives and how to design meaningful assignments that are tied into the student learning outcomes, but also reflect our students' lived experiences. And then our last session we did on serving students with new technology, and we introduced EAB and Program Mapper and all these other technologies. This is something we will continue to do because it gets the word out there about guided pathways, and people are able to take what they learn back to their department. So, and speaking of program mappers, let's get another kind of technology piece. And I know many of the colleges, uh, community colleges in California, are using program mapper, program pathways mapper, um, developed in um, uh, collaboration between Bakersfield College and Concentric Sky. And so we are now on the program mapper. Um, bandwagon, I guess, and, and are kind of knee deep in this implementation right now and we'll continue over the summer. But the great thing is, and actually maybe I can share my screen uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with it can kind of see what some of these look like. Um, and Tracy, so, while you do that, I'm going to answer a question really yes, quick yes. from Becky, and she yes. asked how our participation was. We actually had really good participation. The one where we had our guest speakers from the ASCCC, we had over 60 participants. Our VPs came. It was really great. I think in an average workshop, we had no fewer than 10 show up, I would say would be about the average. We had full-time, part-time. There was often a really heavy um, counselor component. Um, there were some days that um, we saw some members from the staff side, but not many. It was really more geared towards faculty, I think. And one of the discussions we are having is, um, you know, in the future, broadening, like bringing in other, you know, other parts of the campus community to that. But it was really well received. So, yeah. All right. So uh, this is actually Bakersfield College's <laughs> website, but the program mappers um, that the colleges are implementing really all, really all look like this. Um, as I said, we're kind of knee deep in this process right now for us. So I do actually have some sample ones that we're working on, but just so you can see a full program map, here's an example from Bakersfield College for kinesiology applied exercise science. And um, all the effort that we put into developing the program maps uh, we were using um, basically Excel worksheets, turn them into PDFs, uh, where we're, we had the faculty kind of sequence out their courses. And with the help of myself and other counselors, we helped them identify GE courses to kind of fit in along the way, help them make sure that they captured enough electives to have the correct number of units they would need in order to finish a degree. Um, but all those efforts in the previous academic year really helped set the stage for us to be able to do program mapper. And one of the great things about this um, particular um, template or, or the way it's set up is that students can look at the courses and get more information about them, including course descriptions, 
um, unit values, course titles, et cetera. In the case of GE categories, they can see the whole list of courses within that GE category. And they can look at the map view. They can look at a list view instead. So it's a little bit more interactive than what we have available currently, which again, are just program maps on a PDF. Um, and additionally, um, it provides information about labor market uh, info and just tying the programs of study to uh, potential uh, opportunities in terms of employment. Um, and if we decide to, we could also incorporate little video clips that share more about that particular, that particular program of study or the field, um, the career field most closely associated with it and provide students both current students and prospective students with the program learning outcomes. So yeah, another great project that we're working on that's taking a fair amount of time, but I'm really excited. It's a really cool yeah. platform. I'm excited about this. And I have to tell you, so Tracy and I have taken this around to like our department chairs council, the faculty senate. This is something our faculty are so excited about because it's really gonna help us transform our, how we are sharing information with our students. And so, you know, when you get that student that shows up to your office and says, what can I do with a major in such and such? You go, well, let me show you this. And we have, this really will provide some great resources for the students. And, um, and this is just one of the things that when we share this with the faculty, like we had anything to do with it, but the fact that, oh, Angela Tracy, thank you so much. And, you know, really, um, it was, we're really grateful to our administration for being willing to invest in this also. And I think a, a shout out to our director of institutional research, Dr. Amber Rock, um, who, who came from Bakersfield College, um, but she really was um, critical, I think played a critical role in making sure that we could pursue this. And yeah. with the support of uh, not just Dr. Roth, but our Dean of uh, Strategic Initiatives, um, Dr. Linda Clowers and our VPs, um, Miranda Perez as well. I'm gonna go back to the PowerPoint, but I think I might be shifting gears again back to websites. I think we're looking at, oh yeah, okay. Yeah. Speaking of, um, I'm gonna go back to, so, one of our projects has been to really build out our guided pathways and our learning and career pathways pages. And it's been really exciting. We built out the guided pathways page, really developing the resources available to faculty, to students, place where we document all our information. And then this links to our learning and career pathways page, which Tracy has up for you here, showcasing our seven pathways. We um, should add that we are adding an eighth pathway. Um, we have seven pathways, but we are adding an eighth one, um, exploration and discovery, which is going to be towards our students who are undecided, maybe undeclared majors. It's a large portion of our student population, and we want them to have a sense of belonging. We want them to have a group that they're a part of and that we can tar offer them targeted resources as well. So this is what we've come up with. And we have some amazing, amazing people behind the scenes who have been helping us with all of this. And uh, Tracy will tell you a little more. Yeah, I just thought I'd show you the current version of these program maps. So um, this is what I was talking about in terms of the, just the PDF. So just kind of a very basic uh, term by term listing of courses. And in some cases, the faculty really wanted to make sure students had more information about um, classes that they might need a prerequisite to, or if there's some other special way to get into a class. Um, so here's an example with music. But again, if we didn't have this effort already uh, in place, um, going forward with that program mapper implementation would be much, much harder. Um, so we started rolling out this program mapping effort, as we mentioned before, and uh, basically in 20, 2019, uh, 2019, uh, 2020. Um, and we started slowly, but we do have, well, we have a boatload of programs, first of all. <laughs> so, um, but we were really looking at prioritizing our associate degrees for transfer and then some of our other more popular degree programs and certificate programs. So we don't have every single one of the 270 some odd programs that we have mapped, um, but we do have well over half. So 
But again, this is an example in the PDF version and it will eventually be converted into Program Mapper. Um, other information that we decided to provide to students uh, include the kinds of, oops, uh, the kinds of interests someone who might gravitate toward this particular LCP might have, skills they could expect to develop if they were to pursue a major within that LCP, a sample list, of course, not an exhaustive list, but a sample list of occupations uh, that they might choose to pursue depending on uh, the major that they select that's associated with that LCP, some additional career-related resources. And we haven't quite fleshed this out, we'll say a little bit more about it in a moment, but also we want, to, we want them to be able to connect with their success team. So here's one um, that's already kind of fleshed out, although we are still working on the others. And I think even this one's gonna go through a bit of a revision. Um, okay, so go back to, Oh, actually, uh, you're in a slide. Yeah. Um, so let's see, we have a question about um, building the maps and thinking about programs in general. Has Guided Pathways encouraged critical thinking on program development? You know, that's a really good question, um, Nicole. And an interesting thing about this, so the thing, one of the things that I think we did well at Cerritos is we had these program mapping days and we brought entire divisions together within the divisions the departments met and they sat down and developed the maps we wanted the departments to feel a commitment and a sense of ownership of the maps and how they recommend the programs. This really did lead to a lot of critical thinking and a lot of unexpected discoveries. Um, we had departments where we gave them copies of their AA degrees and they said, who made this AA degree? Why is this class on here? Why do we have so many classes from this section? And what, is, what happened as a result is programs and departments were developing their maps. It actually spurred action on cleaning up their AA degrees. Um, it, it fostered some interaction between different departments and how they could work together. And, and it, I think it actually even caused some departments to re-examine their identity and their disciplines. So, um, but the key thing was that were these meetings that we had, these mapping days where the departments got together and that's all they did. They didn't have to worry about all we talk about in department meetings. It was this laser focus on this process. And I think it was very manageable, meaningful. Other departments, we like we've identified that there's some departments that have tons of AA degrees and certificates that they may not even be using or even aware of. And so this is leading to one of our goals that we're going to have to clean some of that up as well. It was really a good opportunity too for departments to think about other disciplines, other courses that could support their program. Um, so I have really fond memories actually of that very first program mapping day that Angela was part of her division with the liberal arts division. Um, and with the communication studies department kind of talking to some of the other departments that were there, English department and so on, uh, foreign language, uh, modern languages. Um, say, hey, you know, maybe this comp class would work really well as they were looking at a particular area of general education um, to zero in on maybe a, a more specific comp classes that could support their program. And we saw that with a lot of the other efforts too in other divisions. I remember our Fine, Art, Fine, Fine Arts and Communication Division um, having some really great discussions about, hmm, you know, maybe this economics class could be really helpful. Um, for the natural sciences, the anatomy physiology class could be, you know, really helpful. So um, it did spur a lot of good discussion, and as Angela said, also led to them kind of re-examining uh, some of what they were offering and going back through and, and cleaning up their programs. Tracy, I see we have about five minutes, so we'll kind of go through and just hit on the last couple items here. Um, this next thing, um, this is really fun. I'll keep this to about a minute here. Um, we wanted to find a way to involve students and we needed to develop icons for our learning and career pathways. So we launched a student icon design contest and we invited all Cerritos College students 
to present their original designs to represent icons for our LCPs. And so we launched the contest and Tracy, we can go ahead. I'll go through this really quick. And these were the three finalists. The one in front of you on the right was the winner. And then the two on the left were the second and third place finalists. What we did is we, when we got all our submissions, what we did then is we had our leadership team vote on them first. We narrowed them down to the top three. We then submitted those to the, um, or top five, I can't remember, but we, oh, yeah. top three, we submitted them then to the campus community. Everybody was invited to vote. The faculty, the students, the staff, the deans, the VPs, the board, every, I mean, we invited everybody and we promoted this and the campus community chose the picture you see on the right. The student was given a cash award for her efforts and she's featured now on our LCP page with her name giving her credit. And our second and third place winners also received cash rewards. This also gave us a great opportunity to promote the LCP program on campus to everybody. And so um, it was really kind of fun and I think a great thing for our students for their careers. I would say it was probably the most fun <laughs> project that we have engaged in. It was great. I really enjoyed it. We had so much wonderful talent at the day too. Um, yeah. I think we had 20 some odd submissions. Sometimes there were multiple submissions from the same student, but just the work that they did was so impressive. Um, I would really encourage you to do something like this. It was just really a great, great project. So a lot of fun, brought a lot of joy. Uh, I think the other thing, and I'll try to breeze through this as well, but um, kind of going back to what Angela had said about us including the exploration and discovering a new LCP, making sure that all students have a home. Um, related to that, the counseling services division of which I'm a part, is, has really been working on developing a new model and a new approach uh, to serving our students. And so we're calling this counseling by LCP. It's basically a case mon management approach. And I know a lot of the colleges are kind of grappling with this right now and how they might be able to incorporate case management. Um, so we're heading in this direction right now. We still have some kinks to work out, but the idea is to make sure that every student has a team of counselors um, that they would be able to connect to, who's helping to um, uh, uh, helping to uh, move them along with their pathway, connecting with them consistently, honestly being quite intrusive um, as far as making sure that they can't hide from us and reaching out to them. So um, again, we have all of the programs divided by LCP, including undecided students and a team of counselors who will be serving them. Um, and supplementing that would be this other our post success teams. Tracy, I see we're out of time and I really want to be mindful of, of everybody else's time here. And maybe just take a minute if anybody has any questions, because I know Nicole is keeping us on track and I, I'm grateful. Um, maybe we just see if we have any questions before they before um, we have to wrap that up today. Folks can like to to unmute themselves, or if there's some questions in the queue. Rebecca, do we have some questions in the queue? No, we don't have any. Okay. But I would like to know how did you market uh, to the students to get them to participate in the drawings? Well, we we tried a couple different avenues, but really, what was our best? Um, the best way we did it is we have a great colleague, AJ Mara, who works with our associated student body. And she used, there's an app that they have and she used the app to send the message out to the students. So that was probably the most successful way. We also have um, a newsletter that goes out weekly. The contest was posted there. We let all department chairs, faculty know, ask them to share it with their students as well. We put the information on our Guided Pathways page. So we really tried to hit up every avenue we possibly could. I reached out to our Fine Arts and Communication Dean, asked him in particular to target our graphic design students. So um, we used every channel that we could think of and but I really do think reaching the students through our associated students 
was the most successful. Let me see. Okay, very good. Thank you. Yeah. Do you just have a bunch of accolades in the chat? Thank you for sharing. And folks, um, we when you registered, you shared your email address with us. And um, so in the coming days, takes a couple days for recordings to do their do their magic things and for our communications coordinator to do all the um, background magic to make those recordings available. But um, I will follow up. You'll see an email from me um, that uh, includes um, resources from the session as well as the recording. Once all of that has magically occurred, that will um, show up at, uh, at your digital doorstep. And if you need something sooner than that, um, this is my email address. Um, and so I will send that to you. Had a moment of mental fog there thinking about what my own email address is. Like when you can't remember your house address for a phone. It happens to me with my phone number. <laughs> People then, in your family's names, all those things. They all get lost. They all get lost in the fog. And I'm putting Tracy and my email address as well in the chat if um, anybody would um, like to reach us at all we can be reached and be happy to talk with you and share with you any resources that we have it's so inspirational to um you know as someone who's involved in our guided pathways efforts on my own college i feel really comfortable saying that it just it's so inspirational to hear um what others are doing um how you know they're um thinking broadly while also being focused, it can be a real challenge to step between the macro and the micro with, with guided pathways. And so to, to hear your story um, is so inspirational and to hear the ways in which you've um, really intentionally thought about keeping students at the center of what you're doing, not just in your goals for guided pathways, but in, in inviting them to be participants in the work that you're doing um, is it's really powerful. Thank well, you. I'm already, I've already got my next student contest plan, but I'll have to pitch that to Tracy later. <laughs> but, you know, thank you, Nicole, so much. And um, it's really been a great experience. But honestly, I think we could have a whole nother session on the challenges. I mean, really, you know, we're trying to focus the positives here today, the wins. But that, you know, there are challenges and, the, and there's a big one. And we've talked to Natalie about this as well, is the, the need for more focus on the teaching and learning aspect and the intentionality of that. And the need for more focus on continuing to push for that faculty involvement. So maybe those could be some future sessions as well. We would love that. We would love that. It's so powerful to learn and to norm, right? So that when things get hard, you go, oh, you know what? It's not just me or it's not just my campus or it's not just this, you know, this is thorny. Um, how can we learn together and, and um, find a way to innovate through those things that are really difficult? Um, earlier in your presentation, you had, but I didn't write down exactly what you said, but you said something about um, the ways in which this work is, um, inviting, I don't remember if it was faculty, yeah, through the teaching, we were talking about your professional learning um, and the psychology um, professor who um, was a guest presenter and how it invited um, faculty to think about um, kind of re-envisioning their identity and their role um, and the way in which that learning happens in their classroom, specifically with pillar number four. And I think that that um, speaks to what you're saying here, those ideas of, um, you know, if we're gonna do this work deeply, it's, it, there's gonna be bumps in the road as we go because it's connected to people's identity and to their sense of how they think about what they do. And it's, it's really powerful. Actually, I, I have a quick question for An uh, Angela that when you mentioned about the development day for faculty, how, how you guys make faculty come up and come and sit down for that day? That's very imagine that it's, well, it's hard, not easy, just get them to come uh, sit down the whole day to learn. I think on, honestly to start, part of the success has been because we were in the pandemic 
And our Center for Teaching Excellence did note that they had more participation in professional development this year than they ever have. And there's a lesson here in that offering these professional development trainings through Zoom made them more accessible for people. Mm -hmm. And so it's something for us, what, even when we return to campus to consider to continue to offer Zoom trainings, because it just makes it easier for people to show up in their in their hectic lives. And, and I think that's a really important aspect of it. Um, I think that Tracy and I also really try to embrace a theme of fun and that come that this is going to be a safe place. We're going to have a good time. We're going to exchange ideas. And so we would promote this wherever we could. We were both on Faculty Senate, so we would always announce these things at Faculty Senate. We're both on the Chairs Council, so we would always announce it to the Chairs Council. I would often say to the chairs, if you can't come, make sure to send a rep from your department. And I mean, it's not a mandate, right? But I would just say, if you can't be there, find someone who will come. And so many of them took that to heart and would send me a note and go, I'm sorry, I can't be there, but I'm sending this person from my department and I'm gonna have them report back at our next meeting. And so I think wherever possible, personal invitations, face-to-face -face invitations, personal messages, even on some cases, there were some sessions that we did where I actually wrote people individually and said, hey, we had talked about, prime example, like we had talked about SLOs and your department re-envisioning your SLOs. We're doing a workshop on that. Why don't you come on down? The other thing that we did, most of these were all one hour long. And, you know, people have busy lives and they will come and sit and listen for an hour. And like the great thing was the one GP session we did on equity and guided pathways, we covered a lot of stuff. And the thing that I loved and the feedback we got is that faculty said, hey, wait, can you break these all down and now do individual sessions on them? And it worked really well because our guide, our campus has been doing some great work with equity initiatives, but they're long. They're three weeks long, they're labor intensive, and people like to come to one hour long sessions and to find out, is this for me? What can I learn from this? And then we hope that will lead them to participate in the longer sessions. And then I'd add on, of course, you know, they do have their flex obligation. So um, I think just people looking for interesting topics um, of sessions that they could sit in on and participate in. And I think that, um, you know, them knowing me and Angela and uh, us being really intentional about wanting to have more interactive sessions. And um, I think that appealed to a lot of folks. And then I don't know if Sean, uh, Sean, if this is what you're talking about, but also with the program mapping day and getting them to participate in that, we did pay them. So they got a stipend, a uh, fairly small stipend, $100, um, or they could choose flex credit if they wanted to do that, that instead. Yeah, then, we, um, we do have some sort of the school on the flex day, they did something like that. And uh, a lot of time it, it, it's hard to get so many instructors willing to sit down and discuss and make the plan. The whole, this is very big. I can see the guidance pathway. The first time I heard, I said, oh, maybe something is, but when I see all of you guys put down the plan, wow, it's big. It involves a lot. Then, so many people, like the whole campus, like everybody has to be there. Everybody has to be on the plan, kind of not only the faculty side or the student service side. Sound like wow, that big. <laughs> yeah, and then to answer a question in the chat room and go back. So you're absolutely right, Juan. That you need, like, we need you need campus wide involvement. Um, it was asked. I think Jennifer asked, "What is um, flex?" credit. So I don't know out of state, but in state California Community College 
faculty, full-time faculty are required to do what's called a flex credit, which is usual is like annual professional development. And so at Cerritos College, full-time faculty are required to do 10 hours a year and it has to be, you have to submit it. It has to be approved by your dean and, and so forth. And so a lot of faculty who will sign up for these workshops, they sign up for them and they automatically get flex credit for their time with that. The other thing I've just got to mention with our live sessions when we did the program mapping and you got the whole departments out there, it was the same thing. We said if your full time faculty can't come, you send part time faculty, mm -hmm. bring whoever you can. They got the $100 stipends. And then the first ones that were live, our VP um, brought Portos, which um, if you're from Southern California, we have this fabulous bakery called Portos. And um, and they would bring the goods and people would come and we would just have a pastry and coffee fest, which, you know, you walk in the room, who cares about the hundred dollars? Give me the portos, right? No, that's true. Uh, when you have the food, people come to Yeah, right? Pastries and fun. Pastries yeah. and fun is a very good company. Yeah, pastry, coffee, fools. That yeah. get people. I'm a firm <laughs> believer in that, which is why, yeah, for our GPAC meetings when we were on campus, I would bring food. Um, but it also just helps, I think, just people feeling that sense of camaraderie too as they're working on these different projects. And those were some of my favorite efforts. The design contest, I think, was the first that my, I would rate the highest in terms of just the fun that um, we had doing that. But then the program mapping and the GP presents, those have been some of the um, the most enjoyable experiences throughout this whole thing. Thank you so much, you guys. Thank you. This has been amazing. We really appreciate you taking the time and sharing and um, and staying a few minutes over to even give us some additional, I think, really um, moving pieces of information about how you build community on your campus. Um, you know how you how you create that interest and and keep it sustained and. Um, we're so excited to let's do another one. Let's learn more about the challenges. Let's learn more about what's coming next. Um, it would be great to hear more. Yeah, I want I'm hoping three CSN will um, have another session on success teams and guided pathways. And I would love to see different colleges from around the state showcase their success teams. Totally, totally. We want to continue the spotlights and we um, Shasta did a great presentation a few weeks ago, and I can include that recording when I send out the email to y'all from this one. I can include that recording from Shasta as well. Um, it's great to see um, some of the similarities in approach and some of the differences given this, the difference in size of the institution. And so, you know, how does Shasta as a smaller, more rural college um, build from the middle? How has Cerritos built from the middle? Um, it's, it's great to see that. And I should mention, I apologize for not saying this earlier, but um, in addition to myself and Angela, in terms of our kind of guided pathways leadership team, I did mention our two vice presidents, but there are uh, two deans as well who've been providing some support uh, along the way, uh, at least most recently, because they're fairly new also. Um, they both, I think, came on board just a few months before the pandemic hit. Um, so Dr. Rosa Perez, who's the Dean of Counseling Services, and I did mention Dr. Linda Clowers, who's our Dean of Strategic Initiatives and uh, um, Academic Affairs and Strategic Initiatives. I forget what comes first, but um, so they are also a big part of the team. But thank you so much for inviting us to do this. Really um, our honor to be here. And uh, we're just one piece of the puzzle, right? At, at, at Cerritos, like Tracy said, there's so many people and, and having the support from the administration, the faculty and the students in this endeavor is really key to the success here. We appreciate you so much for coming today and taking the time. Um, and let's do it again soon. Keep an eye on your emails. And as we move toward the lunch hour on Friday, three cheers for hopefully a sunny weekend for all of you, wherever you might be. I think I would say it's not sunny out here, but it's the fog is of a lighter color. And that might, <laughs> that almost counts as sun 
up here today. So we'll we'll count that. Not the, the light fog versus the dark dark fog. Um, enjoy your weekend. Look for that email. And thank you, thank you, thank you, Cerritos, for taking the time and uh, and sharing with us today. Thank, thank you, you so much, everybody. Thanks. Bye.